Just don't pull too much because you'll angle the camera. But. Okay. Yeah, that's not bad. No. Um, we can take picture and picture off for now. Because we still got to do the, the Pledge of Allegiance and all that kind of stuff. So. <clears throat> as soon as that goes away, I'll tell you. 30 second delay. You're good.
Christian. They are elected for three year terms on a staggered basis. They are, most importantly, they do not represent any particular area in the school district. And even more importantly than that, they volunteer. So they're really only here to do what's best for kids. The last two years have really been unbelievable uh, from a superintendent's point of view and from a school board's point of view. We have never, there is no playbook to tell us how to get through these past two years. So we've done the best we can, <coughs> and I think we've really done well. You know, our kids have been in school the whole time, but it's been, it's been a rough way to go. A lot of the information we get is uh, indecisive, and a lot of it is, you know, we're on our own. So uh, to a great degree, we had to make it up as we went along. These individuals um, gave us the direction that we needed to, to try to do the best we could for you and for the students of this district. I really, I really, in my heart, believe that the kids in the district have come out uh, as best as they can. And I think it's uh, because of the overall leadership that we were given by the, the Board of Education. So thank you all, and join me again.
of achievement. In ELA, our IEP students also showed minimum to learn growth, growth and average achievement. For both math and ELA, we have identified IEP students as a growth opportunity for our district. Overall, the learning loss was greater in math than it was in ELA and greater for SPED than non-SPED students. Other areas of concern that were presented included third grade math, ACT scores, and uh, overall COVID-related learning loss. At the conclusion of that presentation, though, there was some discussion regarding ELA and ACT scores, the fact that the state as a whole had experienced learning loss, and the hope that we would turn our trend lines around. Despite the fact that the presentation clearly showed that students who fall under the IDEA umbrella had experienced the greatest loss of learning, there was never any discussion amongst the board regarding this demographic of students. A quick call to Jesse today informed me that students who fall under the IDEA umbrella make up roughly 15.4% of Fort Dumont School District's population. That's about 2,700 students that were overlooked in the discussion of academic excellence. While we have to acknowledge that all students seem to have had some level of learning loss with COVID, students under IDEA experience even more. What effort has been made to understand why <coughs> these students experience the greatest learning loss? Was it due to the fact that when COVID first happened, Jesse allowed districts so many loopholes that even an experienced educational advocate like myself couldn't overcome them? Virtual learning was noted in the presentation to have had less effective outcomes than in person. Given that students under the IDEA umbrella tend to be more medically vulnerable, there was, a, was there a higher number of students with IEPs and 50 boards who went virtual, and perhaps that explains the gap? Who has made a point to seek out deeper understanding of what happened with this massive group of students over the past three years that has allowed them to experience this big rate of learning loss? What study, studies are, are being done to dig deeper into this? What caused FASD IEP students to lose more learning compared to other districts of the, over the same period? Students who are deemed eligible to receive IEP and 504 resources are not just randomly given those services. For 504, they must have a medical diagnosis in order to attain accommodations needed to allow them to succeed in the general academic educational environment. To acquire an IEP, a parent has to meet with district and school representatives, discuss the child's weaknesses in painful detail, consent to extensive testing in the educational areas of eligibility, allow the student to be assessed, come back to the table to hear all the areas in which their student is at least two standard deviations behind, draft appropriate goals with corresponding services and accommodations, and agree to do the whole thing over again at least once every 365 days. The documents drafted at IEP and 504 meetings aren't just to get qualifying students ahead of everyone else. They are designed to get the student to a point where they can hopefully eventually independently function successfully in the general education setting. The resources and accommodations prescribed to these students are as important as a general education ELA lesson plan, a third grade lesson plan, or an ACT prep score. Test scores. These students matter and they deserve a voice. Thank you.
question is um, whether or not students can wear or should wear a wand. What are you doing to keep your black students safe? What are you doing to make sure that they are seeing their voices are heard? Let me get this Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Psalms 56, 3. Be merciful to me, O God, for man will swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me almost high. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God I will praise his word. In God I will put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And you cannot serve God in man. Amen. Matthew 18, 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, I would prefer it, it would be better for him if a milestone were, were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. In the last verse, Psalm 8, 118.8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. I use these verses as we have all been asked to trust the Lord with our money and our most valuable treasure, our children. In saying that, I ask each of you to pray and ask God for the strength to be worthy of the burden of trust that you've been given. Thank you. Thank you to the Board of Education for a large space. Spread out and be healthy.
and safe. It's the right thing to do. The second issue is like other school boards all across our county and other governments across our region, they have a time clock. Why don't we invest a little money and put a time clock either on the wall or on the screen so people know how much time is left. On the agenda, 8D and 8E are very concerning legislation. The first one is a House Bill 1611 that deals with partisan elections. I'm a big believer that you should designate your party affiliation, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, Independent, or any other party that is recognizable by the state of Missouri and the Secretary of State. I, however, disagree with moving that election to the November versus the April because we're gonna lose uh, voters and uh, lose interest. Now the next bill is Senate Bill 649, deals with personal property tax and abolishing them over the next 10 years. Um, it's gonna be absorbed by the real estate tax. Some people may say it's fair versus renters versus homeowners, but I really think that we need to get rid of that old advantage of collecting taxes and paying over and over every year on something that we all paid sales tax when we purchase our vehicles. The next thing is, is the um, Brian Bishop. We're going to be losing Brian Bishop as a principal at East High School, uh, losing him to the Wetzel School District, and I believe it's all over money issues. He will be working over there in a different capacity. I want to bring to your attention, because it's very concerning, this information that was put at my seat. Uh, the Supreme Court decision last week, court case SC 99098, dealing with uh, state, uh, revised state statute 115.646 of the election law that you can't spend public dollars on electioneering. City of Maryland Heights versus the state of Missouri. I would ask that you all look at that case. Uh, the superintendent's contract, by uh, uh, um, asking for that, is still pending with Ms. Mrs. Breen over two years ago. I'm asking for no more secrets of this board. Uh, what are we going to do about the sick time of vacation, over $650,000 that we as taxpayers owe Mr. Debray upon when he leaves the school district next year? Board member qualifications, uh, meeting chapter 163 of the revised state statutes. I don't believe the board members should live in Orange County, Florida. And I ask again, Mr. Edmonds, for your resignation. You are not a Missouri citizen. Political contributions. Uh, Dr. Debray made the maximum contribution to Mr. Schwarmagen. Uh, who's now running for state representative. Dr. DeBray gave $2,000 to Mr. Swarmagen, and I believe that it's very unethical, it's very questionable, especially when we're talking about employer-employee uh, um, relations and contractual obligations. Also, Mr. Edmond also gave you, Mr. Swarmagen, some money, and it's very questionable about Everybody needs to follow the money and encourage everybody to look at the Missouri Ethics Commission con contribution disclosures. And I believe that Mr. DeBray, by giving to, I'm summing up, you, you were very diligent and gave other people 30 seconds additional, so I'll sum up in 10 seconds. Thank you, sir. But Mr. DeBray, it's very questionable and unethical that you have a contract, he is your employer, you're the employee, and you gave the maximum $2,000 to him. That's wrong. And it should be investigated by the Federal FBI and the State Missouri Ethics Commission. Uh, Heather Zakowski. Dr. Gray, members of the board, as we all know, it's been a tough year marked by a lot of division. As we've all tried to navigate COVID, we wanted to take these board meetings in a more positive direction with the public comments. We asked our community to fill out a Google form to recognize the positive things staff have done. Several of us will now be reading those comments, as many as we can. It is our hope to bring some light and positivity to an otherwise difficult year by recognizing some amazing staff. This comment is from a fourth grader at TCE regarding Mr. Hammond. Mr. Hammond is really nice to kids. He's really funny and he lets you call him nicknames. He's just a really nice person. This comment is from an anonymous person about Mrs. Romanchuk. Mrs. Romanchuk has been the third grade teacher for both my children. They absolutely adore her and love how much fun she makes learning. I was thrilled knowing my third grader had her this year when he came back, when he came back and got second semester from virtual. This comment is from Debbie Dent regarding Stephanie Mingy. Thank you for making science so much fun and such an awesome learning experience for my seventh grader. 
He has nothing but nice things to say about what he had learned in your class, and he wished all teachers taught the same way. This comment is again anonymous about Mrs. Silverberg. Mrs. Silverberg genuinely cares about every child in her building and is always quick to address parent concerns. Another anonymous about Charity McCollum. Never in, never in all, alley life, never in all my life, I'm guessing. Sorry, I'm just reading these. <laughs> never in all my life have I ever met someone who makes every child and family she has in her class feel seen, valued, and loved. Ms. McCollum is warm and kind in everything you hope for as a kindergarten teacher, introducing your student to life in elementary school. Her incredible teaching talent is unparalleled, and she is an absolute treasure. Thank you, Mrs. McCollum, for, a use, for you so provide a sound foundation for learning at PSE. This one is actually from myself. It's regarding Mrs. Hunt. Mrs. Hunt has been wonderful over the last two years. She has responded to every single one of my concerns promptly <coughs> and has worked with me to troubleshoot every issue regarding my son. She genuinely cares about her students. As a counselor, she has a lot of students she works with, yet I know she gives everyone the same level of attention she's given me and my son. In these unprecedented times, I know even more has been asked of her and all of our school counselors. I'm so very grateful for her assistance navigating current issues as well as future issues as we get closer to college. I would be a nervous wreck if it wasn't for her reassurance, knowledge, guidance, and assistance. The next one is also from me, regarding Mr. Jennings. Mr. Jennings has been amazing this past year as my son has made the transition back to in-person school. He's been very responsive to each and every concern I've had and has reassured me of policies and procedures in place. It is obvious that he cares about his students and staff and does everything in his power to keep them safe. He has had so much thrown at him these past few years, so many changes to policy, and normal situations have come up. He has done a great job of dealing with all of it while reassuring parents and students alike, always with a smile on his face. <coughs> Heather, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No, that's your time. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm going to call the next person. Are you ready to call the next person? Okay. I am. Okay, that's fine. Is that all right? Yes, that's okay. fine. I was just making sure I marked where I left off so they knew where to start. Heather Mudd. I'm just going to be continuing where Heather left off. Um, this one is about Mrs. Mankus. Mrs. Mankus has shown my son a ton of grace this year in letting him turn in assignments late. I reached out to her and told her what was going on with my son. She was empathetic and very understanding. My son was very relieved when I told him of our email exchange. He doesn't turn in all assignments late and he's always working on them in class. He just isn't as fast as some of the other students and sometimes needs extra time to get the assignments done. I'm thankful for her willingness to help him be as successful as he can be in her class. Um, this is from, also from Heather that's just spoke. Uh, Mrs. Mensinger has been amazing with my son as he transitions back to in-person learning. She has gone above and beyond to make him feel special and comfortable. She has been great in communicating to me what he needs to do and has spent extra time to help him with math as he's struggling with showing his work on assignments since he didn't have to do that when he was virtual. She has given him a ton of grace and infinite patience. She helps him to stay organized and gives him reminders to finish his work. She doesn't just do this for my son, though. She does it for any student in her class that needs it. She always sends reminders to parents of what's due for homework each night, which I greatly appreciate. My son has only been in her class since January, but he, read, but he already talks about her and how much she helps him and how nice she is and how lucky he is to have her as his teacher. She's made a big impact on him in a short amount of time, and by showing him grace, compassion, and going out of her way to make him feel comfortable with the transition. The next one is from Christy Hollowell for Mrs. Schramm. Um, Mrs. Schramm encompasses a teacher that is there for all the right reasons. She cares so much about the whole student. She cares about their physical, mental, and emotional health and offers several ways to earn grades in her classroom with the underlying theme being that the student has to prove that they understood the material. She is willing to spend the time to find out what works for each individual student, and in doing so, not only is a student who may not be successful in another classroom environment successful in her class, they are also given the confidence to be successful in their other classrooms. I'm so grateful that my son was moved into her classroom this year. She is really one of a kind and quite possibly the best teacher any of my children has ever had. Thank you, Mrs. Schramm. The next one is from Rachel Faulkner for Dr. Mueller. Dr. Mueller has always been extremely responsive with my daughter's needs. She's easily accessible and you can tell that she takes the overall well-being of her students very seriously. 
She's gone above and beyond on multiple occasions to make my girls feel heard and cared for. I find her to be extremely professional and kind. Um, the next one is for Nicole uh, Joyner. Mrs. Joyner has been an amazing asset to have during the last two years. Our family needed to navigate through online schooling and re-entry to in-person school this year, and she was awesome. She is compassionate, encouraging, and everything you want your counselor to be, but sadly, you don't always find. We are beyond grateful to have had her for the last four years. Um, and then for Mrs. Cleaver, our daughter, uh, this one's anonymous. Um, our daughter was lucky enough to have Mrs. Cleaver for fourth grade a few years ago, and I hope our son will have her someday as well. Mrs. Cleaver is everything you would want your child's elementary school teacher to be. She comes to school each day with a smile on her face and presents a positive attitude to her students even during these difficult times. She models what it means for her students to be good citizens. She is caring and kind and thoughtful of others. She values her students' unique personalities and encourages them, helping to reach and exceed their potential. I cannot think of a better person to entrust every day with the safety, care, and education of our children. Did, did you hear that? Yeah, I, I thought I did. <coughs> Amy Rhodes. This is an anonymous one for Mrs. Nicole Bennett. Mrs. Bennett was my son's first grade teacher for the first half of last year. Mrs. Bennett did such an amazing job both teaching and handling the newness of a virtual classroom. She had great graphics, animated too. She kept the kids engaged and everything was organized and easy for parents to find on campus. Her lessons were fun and interactive and she did an excellent job of keeping the kids involved and participating. She held virtual lunches for the kids with buddies so we could have some social interaction as well. And she always ended up being invited, spending her own lunch time getting to know the kids better. Best of all, Mrs. Bennett made her classroom a place of comfort, grace, and kindness each day, providing the stability and positivity kids desperately needed that semester. This one's for Ryan Montgomery. But, um, it was written by Michelle Cooper. Mr. Montgomery has been very supportive of my son's progress in ELA. He has inspired Jack to read more challenging books and to think more deeply about them. Thank you. This one is uh, written by Lindsay Dunn for Kathy Elmore from Mount Hope. Kathy Elmore, first grade teacher at Mount Hope Elementary, is someone I highly value and respect in the field of education. My daughter is in her class and has shined beautifully because of the nurturing, care, and encouragement that Mrs. Elmore has supported to her every single day. Her empathy, love, and support inevitably has influenced my child's attitude, confidence, and overall self-worth. Mrs. Elmore should be recognized for her outstanding classroom management skills, exceptional communication with students, parents, and her radiant, bubbly personality. We are so grateful for her hard work and dedication to the students. This is anonymous for Judy Hudson from SPE, a paraprofessional. Mrs. Hudson has worked as a para at SPE for 30 plus years. She also works with the students at Y Club before and after school. Every day she is happy to work with children and truly cares about each day. Her dedication is unmatched. Thank you for all you do, Mrs. Hudson. This is anonymous for Mr. Gary, a custodian. Mr. Gary works outside in the parent pickup and drop off line every day. Every morning my daughter has dreaded going to school for the last three years. I have to give her pep talks every morning to get out of the door. By the time we get to school, she is usually in panic mode until we see Mr. Gary. He is always enthusiastically waving with a big grin on his face. He is truly happy to be there, and you can clearly see he truly just loves life. My daughter and I always have a light-hearted conversation about him and about how happy he always is. We we'll make up silly stories about what his joyful life is probably like outside of school, and about all the funny things he does at school. <coughs> we spend the rest of the time in the drop-off line laughing and smiling until she gets out of the car, I really don't know if I would have been able to get her to school half of the time without Mr. Gary there to show us that school um, can, really can be a happy and fun place. His smiling face and contagious joy has really made a difference in our mornings the past few years. And for that, I cannot thank him enough. Thanks for spreading positivity and love. Thanks. <coughs> uh, sorry. Our final speaker will be Adeline. Adeline? Adeline. Adeline Williams. Thank you. Thank you. I'm continuing the love letters. Um, this one is from Miranda Cato uh, for Mrs. Moreland. 
she is the best. She's the best teacher in the world, and I love her. Also that she's very nice, and she's like a mom to me when I'm at school without my mommy. Um, another one is from Miranda Cato for Mrs. Connor and Mrs. Callum. Uh, they're very nice, and I love how they care and help us and take care of school for us, um, and I'm thankful. Uh, another one from Miranda Cato for Coach Clymer. Um, Coach Clymer is super nice and funny, and she loves sports just like <coughs> you. Um, Another one from Miranda Cato for the West Hoff um, Lunch Ladies. My Nana was a lunch lady and I know they work super hard and I want to say thank you for feeding us and taking care of us. Um, last one from Miranda Cato for Marky Bibb. Um, she is my bus driver and my mommy, but she loves all of us and keeps us safe and does fun things with us. She decorates and cleans and tells them all good morning and goodbye. She is the best in the world. Um, anonymous for Chris Daly. Mr. Bailey is widely agreed to be the best teacher in the school. He's funny and he actually acts like a real person. Um, another one's from uh, Fort Sumal Parent, um, unnamed, uh, for Marky Bibb. Marky is a dedicated and responsible bus driver for our district. This last two years have been hard, but she has remained a constant and stable presence and we're very grateful to have her. Um, a second grader from um, MHE uh, for Rosemary Custodian at MHE. Rosemary does a good job cleaning up the classrooms at school. She's a very nice person and thinks we should help her um, more by leaving less messes. Uh, another one from a Fort Zumal parent for Eric Powers. Eric Powers is a custodian at a district in at a district high school. His enthusiasm for his job and for the school is obvious and infectious. Um, Carrie Schindler for a staff of Darden Elementary. Darden Elementary is a unique school in our school district with its own particular challenges. It would be impossible for me to select just one member of the staff at that school to think because I have countless experiences with so many of them that have positively impacted my own children. Every single staff member there works so closely together as a team to help students succeed. And in the many years I've had a child at Darden, I've seen countless acts of selflessness by those staff members and I couldn't possibly list them all. I want to thank, take this moment to thank everyone that works at Darden for helping raise kind and intelligent children, regardless of the environment those children have outside of school, and to do so with such effectiveness given the limited resources available at the school. I hope that everyone will realize, as I do, what important and valuable work Darden staff are doing to help better lives of every single child that passes through its doors. Thank you, Darden, for your dedication and improving the lives of our children through love, compassion, and education. Um, a middle school parent um, for, oh wait, hold on. Sorry. Okay, this is an anonymous one for Meredith Nolfo. <coughs> Nolfo is a heart and soul of the library at our school. She is loved by all. I got two more. Hopefully, I get you. Um, middle school parent says for Megan Beardman. Mrs. Beardman has always been one of my kids' favorite teachers, but she has been particularly amazing throughout the last couple of years. When school was virtual, she was often polling parents to see and try to improve that experience for her students and others. It did not go unnoticed. Last one is from Heather Mudd for Mrs. Colleen McEwen. I'm fortunate to have a second child in Ms. McEwen's class. She's phenomenal. She works very hard to make sure she is meeting every child where they are and working how they learn. I was so excited to see her as a teacher for my third grader. The district is very lucky to have a fantastic teacher. Kudos for her for being spectacular. We finished all the Thank you very much. Include the comments from the audience at this point. I have a motion to, uh, to approve the consent agenda. I move for approval with the suggestion that the coronavirus update be moved to new business. Old business. Old, old business. Okay, I have a motion. I need a second. Powers, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, financial reports. Mr. Orr is not here. Mr. Orr is not here. I'm going to pinch it. Uh, you have the uh, Jeff Orr's uh, summary of the finances for the past month. Uh, where we are uh, at the end of January, we have a fund balance, cash balance of $126,896,121.16. Of that amount, $122,282,000 is invested in certified investments. Um, that uh, balance rose from December by $32,655,938. That was because our revenues exceeded our expenditures. 
We received revenues for this for January totaling $50,885,276.84. And about $40 million of that was our tax money. So this is the time of the year that the taxes roll in. Um, we only had expenses of uh, $18,242,960.30, of which $16.2 million were salaries and benefits. Um, so that's pretty much a, a routine number, that $18 million. Um, our revenues are running at $190,769,430, and that is 75% of what we projected revenue in the budget to be. And we are three quarters of the way through the year. So uh, we're right on with our revenues. Our expenses, $117,834,124, that's running about 46% of our budgeted expenditures. The reason that's lagging behind is we have those six, some of the reasons, we have those six payrolls that go to our staff, and those don't go until the summer. So consequently, um, we're going to be ahead of where our, where our, uh, our revenues are. So, we're only close to about 50%, but that's, that'll catch up in the summer. That leaves us at a balance of about 15%. So that's pretty good. Now, let me caution you. I sent you all a memo today from um, an update on the legislative session, and the legislature, the senators, are arguing now on appropriating the Essers three money. Now, for Fort Sumal, that's $10.8 million, one-time money. Um, but they have to appropriate that money before, June, uh, before March 24th, or the money goes back to the federal government. And that's like $1.9 billion. So we need to let our senators know they need to, they need to get, done, get on with the business and get this money to the schools that was promised by the federal government. Now, as far as... Um, Accounts payable for the month, we had $3,692,567, and that amounted to uh, $2,968,636 in regular accounts payable, and $347,100 in ACH payments, and then in our utilities, that's another $376,830 for a total of $3,692,567. That's your accounts payable. You've had that report that you could look at for the last couple of days. Uh, and that's, uh, that's my report on the finances where you're at. You're at $126 million as a balance. And that'll only go down because, you know, once you get your taxes, that's not going to come in every month like that. Any questions for the superintendent regarding the financial reports? If there are none, I need a motion to approve. Power. Power, second, please. George. I'm sorry, George. Oh, thank you. Mr. George, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Like sign. Motion carries. Thank you, guys. All right, old business. Uh, coronavirus update, Dr. Gray. Uh, the coronavirus update you saw in your uh, consent agenda. Uh, the numbers keep going down. Um, uh, as of this afternoon, we had four staff members out of our 3,000 staff members that had positive cases, and we had uh, about 22, 23 uh, students out of, our, out of our school district, out of our 17,500 students. So we have many buildings that have no staff members uh, that are out, and we have uh, several buildings that have no students out. So that number continues to go in a positive direction. I don't see that changing at this point. We still have a, a plan uh, that says if we get to 4%, we're going to mask up in that particular building. Um, and at this point, no one is anywhere close. I think every building is uh, well below 1%. So I don't foresee us going, going uh, back to that, but th that uh, threshold is there. And um, other than that, um, that's pretty much where you stand. I anticipate things will continue to go down. 
Questions? Yeah, so we have a decision made, right? We, last month, we had the conversation about the lawsuit. We said we began with that statement. So that's, that's kind of what I wanted to get a better understanding of before we sit with that. So when Gerard told us that we had until this board meeting before we had to make a decision, so we have to make a decision, give her direction following this meeting. Those are part of this discussion, right? Yes. Okay. So just got to restate so that we're sitting right now from a student perspective across the district at 0.16%. And the numbers that I have, that's 29 kids out of our 17 and a half thousand. I think it's good news. I think it's great news, frankly. I think everybody would agree with that. I saw, I watched the data very closely. We had schools that increased during January, as expected. We had mask mandates put in place for half of our schools. All of our schools went back down in about the same time frame. Good data, too. I still stand where I did last month, which is the, the attempt at putting our district resources, our money, our time, our effort into fighting to keep something that we are not using is the wrong thing to do for our kids and our community. So that's the point that I wanted to make here. And where that lands, I want to go ahead and make a motion that we drop all mitigation measures associated with all current policy associated with our COVID mitigation measures across the board, not necessarily just because of a lawsuit, obviously that falls into this. The fact is we have moved past this. It's time to have relief for our board and our district with the past behind us and focus on the future. So with that, I'd like to make that motion. For the motion, uh, second. More. More. Discussion? Mr. Callahan? Uh, I, I would like to make a current point to uh, my good friend Thomas. I think that if we step back from our existing uh, mask option program that uh, we are given into a bully, and I do not counsel that from my fellow members of this board, I think we need to stand and hold our ground and keep the 4% rule in place. Respond to that. John, you and I both know there's been any number of lawsuits that could potentially have come up yeah. that we have decided not to engage in. The situation here is that it's not that we're pushing back against a metaphorical bully, but that we want to hold on to this policy. So I would like, with all of that, all respect there, to acknowledge that we have made the decision to walk away from issues, things that we potentially believed in because of the lawsuit. So using that now is, I believe, somewhat disingenuous. We've done it. We've done it repeatedly. Thomas, I am not being disingenuous to you and I might fellow members of this board, I think if we give in to this, this is a state that has provided a devolution of power down to the lowest possible level to the uh, school boards, and this is encroachment by Missouri Attorney General into our area of government, and I will not give in to that. I I sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. No. Let the board... This is no, we're not holding on to a policy solely because somebody outside of this district said that we should get rid of it. And if the reason that we're holding on to this is because we want to fight back against, again, a metaphorical bully, that's exactly what we're doing. We're putting the ego in front of the right direction for our district. If there's a different reason, then let's, let's have that different reason. But using that as a reason puts the ego in front of direction. From my perspective, it's not ego. It is our responsibility. Any other comments? Well, as far as um, just in response to Thomas, yeah, I mean, the numbers are down. It's definitely a good thing. It's a great thing. Um, now, as far as what we do from here, I think right now it's something that's, I guess you could use the metaphor. If it's not broke, you know, don't fix it. But I think the numbers are down. People get to.
pretty much do what they want to do as far as the Mavs. I think, you know, everybody is earning that right or whatnot, whatever term you want to use. But um, as far as the, so my position on this, me, me personally, doesn't have anything to do with the Attorney General. To me, he's not even about, he, he's a total non-issue. So I have zero respect for anything he's doing. And my only reason for the for not agreeing with changing any Mavs communication at this point is because Right now, everything's going fine, and it's great. I think this. I think we need to keep this policy in place until the end of the year, and then we can revisit it then. But right now, everybody gets to do pretty much what they want to do. If you want to wear masks, wear them. If you don't, don't. The numbers are down, so it. So the risk is extremely low. Um, so that's, like I said, that's just my my opinion on the topic. Um, I don't know as far as you know. That's obviously, prior to me getting here. But as far as walking away from all super things like that. I don't, I'm not privy to any of that, but uh, so, so for me, the lawsuit has zero to do with anything as far as my, as far as my position. But, uh, the numbers are down, and that's great. And, uh, I think that's something we should just lean on at this point and keep an eye on, um, at least until, like I said, to the end of the year. And at that point, reassess it and see kind of where we are with it. Our cold season really isn't over yet. It's still, still winter. I mean, we still have time to go. So I think we need to at least make it out of this breeding season of bacteria before we start trying to change things, especially now that everybody pretty much gets to do what they want as far as wearing masks and not wearing masks. Mr. Holmes, if I may, mm -hmm. um, you made the comment that it doesn't have anything to do with the lawsuit, but question I think that's before us has everything to do with the lawsuit and that is if we decide to not make a change to our policy we're going to have to expend dollars that are better suited for our kids and for our teachers and for the operation of the school district even when the, the assistant attorney general made the comment that if we drop the law if we drop our policy they would drop the lawsuit without any additional uh, strings attached. So, you know, if it comes back in April or May, then the board could make another change. But at this point, I don't know why we would want to continue to put up a, a roadblock and, and know that we're going to write a check to an attorney to fight a lawsuit that we're not even close to the mitigation levels to begin with. I, I, you know, and I can completely understand your point of view. And I'm not saying that you're wrong. Um, however, right now, like I said, I'm, I'm more focused on on our student body, the long term with them. I'm not, that, like I said, that attorney general doesn't, I, I, I can't factor that in. He put himself into the situation. So nobody, I mean, this is him infusing himself into this. So just because he decided to position himself kind of as a martyr, I'm not, that's not going to change my position or my opinion. And yeah, I know it's gonna cost money. I mean, and, and that's unfortunate. And shame on the Attorney General for the only Attorney General for putting himself in a situation, putting us in a situation to have to pay for any type of legal fees. So um, that's just how, you know, that's my position on it. You know, I know you have your position, I respect that. Um, you know, like I said, that's just my, my personal. And like I said, no, I get it. You're, you're looking at like, why do we wanna pay for lawsuits when we don't even Seems like we don't have any the dog to fight for the real um, Well, and just a rebuttal to that, I guess for me, my position is that if you can hit it, then we have that ability to do so. But if by dropping the lawsuit, we're not expending dollars that we don't really have to waste. And I say waste because it is, in my opinion, it just everything as <coughs> well is that it's a frivolous lawsuit, but it is a lawsuit. And he is the state's top attorney that he, through the courts, has served us with a lawsuit. So we have to defend it. We have to pay, we have to do something. We either comply or we fight it. So I don't I don't know that we have any other avenues. Mike, if I can make a comment. I just I think we need to also just be aware that the attorney general isn't acting uh, as a sole entity in this. He is acting upon, uh, which we're, we were reminded by a few individuals at our last meeting, 
of the people that he's hearing from as well. Uh, we've seen emails to that, and, and there have been people that have reached out to him. He's not doing it just solely just to be doing it for himself. He's doing it because he's hearing from the people of Missouri as well that this is what they want. So that is another consideration to take into this, that there's a, you know, as we've seen in our surveys, that, that we are divided. Well, there's, he's still hearing from people from their side saying they want the mandates gone. It's he's acting on their behalf. It's not that he's just acting solely on this by himself. Well, I have a question regarding that. Where was he when the people went to him and wanted him to and wanted their kids to be protected. He told them to pound sand. So this is about him. This is about his political agenda and pushing through what he wants to get the votes. And, and it's not right. You would probably get a hard argument from people that did reach out to him and asked him to step in and help out. But he did that, not help out unless it went with his agenda. But at that point, he was, I mean, at that point, the students that wanted to be masked or the parents that wanted their students to be masked could still mask, right? We weren't yeah. saying that they couldn't mask. He's, he's not saying you can't mask if you want to mask. He's just saying that don't force somebody to take their liberties away at this point. Okay. And, just, and just as Mr. Holmes, he, he mentioned the same thing. Everything's going fine right now. Everyone right now can do exactly what they want. They want to mask, they can wear a mask. They don't want to wear a mask, they don't want to wear a mask. Exactly what you said would be exactly what we're uh, asking for. I've said an opinion on this so many times, maybe to say it again. I think everybody in this district knows where I stand on this and what I think of our Attorney General. So I'll leave it at this. I can't talk about one more thing. If there is, I, I won't miss much to some people's appreciation. I will not be here this summer. Um, if there is an opportunity or a chance that this board might decide this summer to drop these mitigation methods. Right? And I would have to think that if the, if the opportunity exists, that looking at a dashboard that is 0.16% probable cases would be a data point that you would say is good enough to drop it. Yet if that, that opportunity exists, as Mr. Ellis brought up, then you should definitely dig deep and ask yourself if putting out the check today for something that was similar numbers in just a few months you would drop is the right thing to be doing. <laughs> if, if that opportunity exists, I don't know if it does, but this board truly does believe that they could drop this this summer. I would think these numbers would show that they should. Then we are spending money today for something that we potentially plan on dropping in just a couple months. And if, if that is a um, if that is a good steward, if that is being a good steward of this district's money, then I would question Question that's the death theory, that consideration. And that's all I have. Any other comments prior to vote? Roll we'll call, please. Erica? <coughs> well, let, let's clarify what the vote is. So, a yes vote would be to drop the mitigation strategies and comply with, well, they would basically then. Negate the need for a lawsuit. We drop our mitigation strategy. Right. Okay. <coughs> Erica? No. Gabriel? No. Craig? Yes. Tom? Yes. John? No. Tommy? No. Mike? Yes. So we're going to fight the lawsuit. We'll talk about, we'll talk about that in some closed session. Yeah. All right. Any other comments regarding the coronavirus? If not, we can move on to new business. Dr. DeBrick. Uh, first item under new business, J.B. Nay is going to present to you our recommendation for E-rate uh, reimbursement for the next year. J.B. Thank you, Dr. DeBrick. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, tonight, I bring to you our proposal for E-rate purchases for this summer. Um, this project would be funded through FCC E-rate guidelines, and we have followed all the rules accordingly because those are defined by the FCC. So we put out for bid uh, the renewal of our maintenance and license agreement for our district firewall that services the entire district and is based in our data center. Um, we have to renew that each year in order to, to continue to provide support 
um, to that internet connectivity that we have for all of our students and staff. With that, stop. Please, please. Thank you. Go ahead, JD. All good. Thank you. Um, with that in mind, uh, we put out to bid um, that license and maintenance renewal request. Uh, we received one valid bid back. Uh, that bid was from ProVision Data Solutions. Um, they held the same cost as they provided to us last year. They were the same provider last year, so there was no increase in cost from last year to this year. Um, their total cost is $124,844. Because this is an E-rate project, we are following all the guidelines to get reimbursement on that, so we would get a 50% reimbursement um, through this project. So I would ask for your approval, and any questions I would be happy to answer. Any questions for JV? Not any the motion to approve the E-rate network reimbursement recommendation that was presented. Motion. Power second. Who? Helms? Yeah. Helms. Helms. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Moving to the next item. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next item is the extended school year recommendation for the summer. Uh, Laura Smith has that. Extended school year is our special education summer program. Yes, thank you, Dr. Gray, members of the board. Uh, in your packet this evening, you do have the memo outlining extended school year for this coming summer. Just a reminder, extended school year is special education services provided to students who uh, are, have been found eligible for extended school year by their IEP team. The program outlines will be similar to previous years and will be located at Carver South Elementary this summer. If you have any questions, I am willing to answer them. If not, I would appreciate a yes vote. Dr. Smith, uh, earlier there was uh, a parent speaking to the uh, learning regressions as far as ELA and math. Is this going to help in that area? Will that be something that can be offered to those students? If an IEP team had determined that a student had been negatively impacted due to COVID, uh, we would definitely consider that as an IEP team. So it's an individualized decision for each student. But in addition to that, we are spending time looking at that data and strategizing uh, what exactly, with special education it is so individualized, but looking at what has caused uh, students to not achieve and moving forward as an individualized plan to make up for that. So, so yes and. Okay, well, and pardon my ignorance, but is that something then that's initiated by the parent or by the teacher or how does one become eligible for that um, extended summer plan if they are on a 504 or an IEP? It's determined annually by the IEP team. It's okay. required to be a part of that. And if the parent felt that they have realized that there has been some substantial loss during that time frame, they just request to have that IEP reconvened just for the purpose of ESY or for other concerns that they may have. for Dr. Smith. If not, I need a motion to approve the extended school year recommendation as presented. Okay. Our second, more, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Next is our regular summer school uh, program recommendation from Jen Waters. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, in your packet, you have the outline for uh, what I feel like is a pretty extensive program for students K-12. 
Uh, starting with our high school students, they'll have uh, opportunities for both credit recovery and credit attainment. Uh, we'll have two sessions. Middle school also will have uh, skills development and enrichment programming. We're looking at a, a little bit of a different schedule. You might have noticed for our elementary students, uh, we added an additional week um, this summer. Uh, also added a half hour to their day. And we're gonna, um, it, it's mostly reading and reading recovery for our seated students, uh, but we are going to infuse a little bit of math in there as well. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, we did split that calendar up for the first time in a long time, I think. So we're going to do two weeks at the start of the summer and then two towards the end of the summer uh, with our seated STEAM camp also running in between there. So our reading students will also have an opportunity this year to do STEAM camp, which is something we have not been able to work out before. So um, it'll be a first time for us to try it this way and hopefully we'll get teachers that want to teach and students that want to uh, attend. But we are well into the planning stage of all of this, and I think it'll be a good summer. Any questions for uh, Mrs. Waters regarding the summer school recommendation? And I'm assuming, again, this is, and I know Eric and I had, we had a discussion last week when we talked about the learning regressions and the loss of learning. Mm -hmm. and this is something that she said that it was already kind of ongoing, but this is something that will help bring kids back up to where they need to be because COVID has just wrecked us. Absolutely. Okay, okay, good. Uh, any other questions? If not, I need a motion to approve the summer school recommendation as presented. Uh, Mr. Holmes, second. Second. Mr. Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Dr. DeBrick. Very good. The next two items are resolutions we're presenting to the Board of Education to see if you want to take a position. The first one is a resolution opposing House Bill 1611. Uh, that's a resolution urging state representatives and state senators to oppose House Bill 1611 and or any related or amended bill version, which may create a partisan local election, as well as any amendment to move the municipal elections to November. So um, basically the two items out of this that are of concern to Missouri School Boards Association as well is that they're asking uh, school board members to identify with a political party, and they're asking to move the election from April to November, which is a time when political elections uh, take place. So Missouri School Board is uh, opposing it. They think it's gonna politicize uh, school districts, which are really not supposed to be politicized. So um, you've had this for a week or so that you could look at, uh, I would recommend to you that you would approve the resolution opposing House Bill 1611. Any discussion before we take the motion? Mr. Evans, I think, unfortunately, I think school boards have moved far beyond the concept of not being politicized. That's, that's gone. And at least, and I voted returns uh, three years ago. I didn't see it. I don't think it was even there in the same way. It's gone now, unfortunately. Um, you know, also, I'm concerned about the fact that I do have a problem with the idea that we have elections that drive representative government or representative bodies that get five, six percent turnout for them. So, much as I appreciate a lot of the concepts in this, I, I can't support it. Any other comments? Motion then to approve the resolution opposing House Bill 1611 as presented. George, second. Powers. Powers. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. aye. Uh, motion carries. Next item. Yeah. <clears throat> Next item is a resolution uh, opposing Senate Bill 649. Uh, that is a resolution urging state senators and state representatives to oppose Senate Bill 649 and or any related or amended bill version which would phase out or eliminate personal property taxes. Fort Zumwalt School District gets $22 million every year. We are a tax-supported organization. 
And so far in the uh, legislation that's been proposed, there's no good way to replace it. Um, so if you're going to take $22 million away, okay, I get that. But then you need to have a plan as to how that money is going to be replaced for the schools and the ambulance districts and the fire districts and uh, cities. And so far, everybody is opposed to this. That I, I'm, I'm talking about these taxing jurisdictions. So um, I would recommend that you would oppose this particular uh, legislation. And this sure. is put on St. Charles County. Right. Yes. So this bill is St. Charles County only. Yes. It's not a crime. That's correct. That's correct. We tried to get it the whole state and then it dropped you. That's correct. Because no one else wants it. Right. So. I'm the first person to tell you that I don't like taxes. I don't want to see taxes go up or even pay them if we don't have to. And I'm all in favor of uh, a Senate bill like 649 if he had some alternative to show that, you know, there has to be some, somehow to keep the services that we enjoy as a public, fire, EMS, uh, police, community college, public schools. Um, so, and to your point, yes, it's it's only for St. Charles County. So. Any other discussion? I would also look out that in my three years here, we have invited Senator Eichel to this board, both publicly and privately, multiple times, numerous times, in fact, and he hasn't shown up a single time. That's true. Would have appreciated an opportunity to sit down and discuss how this bill may or may not impact our school district and what our opportunities are for before something that we have to put in the legislation that was pushed for, uh, a direct impact on us. And maybe it is the right thing or not. It would have been nice if in the last three years it could have shown up, even when we told us he was going to. Any other comments? I agree with that. Uh, we were afforded the opportunity to plead our case and have earnest discussions. And also <clears throat> on the tax part, uh, nobody likes to pay taxes, but everybody likes their kids educated. And when they make that phone call, and when they need it, the police and the firefighters show up. But uh, you can't do that without funding. Okay. If there are no other comments, I need a motion then to approve the resolution opposing Senate Bill 649. Helms, second. Joel Powers. I'm sorry, bro. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. All right, next item. All right, the next item I want, we, we have a short presentation that uh, I and Laura Wagner are going to make to the board, so I'm going to move out here in front. We wanted to update the school board on the campaign to pass our Proposition 4. Proposition 4, as you know, is a $125 million, no tax increase bond issue. That will be voted on on April 5th. It will take 57% to pass a supermajority, um, and it is it will not be it will not increase taxes. Our current debt service levy is bringing in enough money that we can add the additional bonds and not increase that debt service levy. That's what the, why they call it a no tax increase. So. Um, I just want to say that this has been endorsed by the O'Fallon Chamber of Commerce, the Greater St. Charles Chamber of Commerce, and our own FCEA education organization. The cities are considering their support at this time. They haven't had a chance to get the resolutions to the, their councils or their aldermen. So um, that's what it's all about. We have a short slide presentation. Uh, that uh, we are using with the public, so you can see that in the back of the room. Um, no tax increase bond issue. This is the fourth of four bond <coughs> issues that were originally foreseen in our 10-year plan that was originally adopted in 2012. So we had three bond issues up until we should have had it last year, but we delayed that to this year. So. We're, we're trying to catch up with our bond issues so that we can deal, deal with all the capital improvements. 
First of all, let's talk a little bit about bonding capacity. Our bonding capacity is 15% of our total assessed valuation. So we have an assessed valuation of $2,948,556,515. So 15% of that is $442 million. That's our bonding capacity. That's the amount we could vote, but we have to first take away our existing debt. We have an existing debt of $135 million. <coughs> When you subtract $135 million from the $400 million, we have a, a final bonding capacity of $307 million. So that's what we can take to our, legally take to our voters, that amount. But what we're asking for is $125 million, okay? Um, what's the next slide? Okay, we've got... Watch this just a minute. This is a brief video that we are showing to our public. Hit that, bar. No sound. Okay. Read the captions. <laughs> Operating revenue is the money Fort Zumwalt uses to operate every day. These funds pay salaries and benefits. Operating funds cover expenses for education materials such as technology and supplies, and they keep, pay to keep the lights, heat, or air conditioning, water, and internet on. The law requires money in either fund only be used for specific expenditures, meaning you can't borrow from one to add to the other. So the difference between operating fund and bond fund. The point is, when you pass $125 million, you can't use any of that money for salaries or benefits or utility payments or anything like that. You do use operating fund money, which is the same money that pays salaries and utilities. So they are, they're definitely different pots of money. So um, we're going to talk about, really quick, phases. We're going to pass $125 million, but we're going to sell it in three phases. $50 million, $50 million, $25 million, or ish, something like that. Um, so it'll be in phases. The advantage of that is once you sell your bonds, you have three years to spend the money. We couldn't spend $125 million in three years. So we're going to go for certain projects with the first $50 million, and that's going to include some of our safety issues that we want. For example, roofing that needs to be brought back under uh, warranty, uh, interior repairs, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Uh, you know, that's become very, very important now with the uh, coronavirus. So we have some old units that need to be replaced, lots of them. Um, we also have our safe rooms. Keep going. There we go. We built a safe room at Flynn Hill, and we have safe rooms at our Clemens Center and our Early Childhood Center that will protect kids up to an EF4 tornado. Um, we are going to add those same safe rooms at all of our elementary schools. Right now, we only have it at Flint Hill and those other two locations. So some of that money is going to go right out at the beginning to build those, those safe rooms. And there you see uh, accommodating the entire school population, safe up to EF4 tornado. It can also be used for other things. They'll be using it as a multi-purpose room. And if they do have some type of a, a storm that would be a danger to the kids, they're safe in there, self-contained restrooms, self-contained ventilation, self-contained power. So that, that's all positive. Other safety projects that we plan um, will have to do with roofing, um, will have to do with uh, upgrades to technology. Um, we want to construct at our elementary schools that don't have a vestibule. 
like, like uh, Lewis and Clark, St. Peter's, we want to construct the vestibule, so we got double door entry in there for safety. That came up at one of our first meetings. Um, what else do we have? We have some, keep going. Okay. Yeah, uh, in, in subsequent phases, um, we need to uh, expand North Middle School. It's landlocked. Um, we need to get them more space because they are growing. We need to expand North High School. They are growing. That's our northwest part of the school district. Um, so um, we need to do that. We need to buy another site that we can use for future growth, and that needs to be in the northwest part, uh, maybe up, up in the area north of uh, St. Paul. Keep going. Clemens Center needs a building addition. Um, we started out there with about a capacity for 35 or so. Uh, what we found is we need to expand that facility so we can take in some high school kids. Um, we've, done, we've done a pretty good job with elementary and middle school, and now we've found that some of those kids can continue with us and avoid taking them outside the school district if we have some more space. So we need another wing on the Clemens Center. Transportation Center, this is coming again, one of the later projects. Um, what we have right now at Westhoff is a trailer, and over at the, uh, the main base is not, not much. We need to expand that and come back with a, with a transportation center that can take in more buses for repairs. Um, right now, I think we can handle two or three. We need to handle more like eight so we can get those buses in good shape and get them on the road. Next, what, what do you got next? <coughs> fine arts and athletic enhancements. Um, we need to spend some money with the fine arts. Uh, we haven't done that in a while. I'm talking about instrument purchases at the uh, middle school and high school orchestras and bands. Um, so that is very, very expensive equipment. Uh, we need to do that. We need to replace our turf fields at north, south, and west. We've already replaced east. They've uh, are there at about 13 years. Uh, they've paid for themselves thus far, uh, but it's time to replace those and, and have them available for teams and uh, PE classes and so on and so forth. We'll update, upgrade our uh, auditoriums, and uh, of course the district swimming pool is in there as well. It's really kind of a small part of this big bond issue that we're talking about. But we are the, uh, there are no high schools in St. Charles County with a swimming pool. And all the high schools in St. Charles County have swim teams. So they're all working out of the recplex. Nobody's really got much room. Um, so we need to uh, build a district pool for our teams, for our PE classes, for any opportunities where we can work with the city of O'Fallon. Uh, in north, the north part of O'Fallon for um, any way to keep that, that swimming pool paying for itself. And we can. We definitely can. We spend $100,000 a year at the Recplex right now. There's other high schools that are spending similar amounts. We can offer an alternative, and the Recplex would love to have us out because their, their residents are wanting more time, and frankly, they've been very good hosts for us. Um, but it's time we share the, the issue, the pain a little bit. So I'd like to see us move in that direction. Um, I, I think we can do a, a, a really good job making that thing pay for itself. Now, that's the bond issue. I want to have Laura tell you a little bit about how we're promoting it. There will not be anyone on uh, April 6th, or should not be anyone, that says, you had an election yesterday? I don't know anything about that. It's not going to happen. Let, let me have Laura kind of run through this with you so you feel comfortable with what we're planning. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Bray. Uh, members of the board, I left two packets for you this evening. And the first is a series of printed tools that summarizes what is on our go.fcsd.us forward slash fcprop4 website. Uh, that website went up shortly after, I think within a few days of your approving Prop 4 for the ballot. So it's been up and running since January. And if you look in the shape of these flyers that you have in front of you, 
it encompasses everything that's on our website in a vehicle that is able to be distributed to the community and simultaneously dispersed on peach jar to all of our parents when we use peach jar that also makes this information available to anybody who accesses our websites just by scrolling to the bottom and clicking on the peach uh, so you'll see there that there's an overview sheet that lets everybody know a basic idea of which buildings are going to have what kind of work done with the passage of FC Prop 4. But you'll also see some what I like to call zoned uh, sheets. So if you are a parent at Mid Rivers Elementary, you would have gotten the FC Prop 4 cover page and you would have gotten the zoned coverage that is on the page with the East High logo, the Debray Middle logo, etc. So you can see what's going to be going on at the buildings that your child will attend. So when you go to go.fcsd.us forward slash fcprop4, you get the overview from the district level. When you visit your school's website, each of our 27 schools has this targeted information so their parents can quickly access what will be happening at their schools within their boundary or that their child will attend. So with that, I'd like to also just mention that those tabs Every zone is available on every page. You just need to use the tabs to move across the district. Uh, with that, I'd like to also mention the second packet, which is our communications plan for FZ Prop 4 to inform our community about the issues, about the issue and what we will be doing with the passage of Prop 4 if we get 57% approval on May, April 5th. Um, there's some flyers. Dr. Gray and I uh, will be hosting two community meetings, March 2nd here in this room, March 16th here in this room. Uh, those are open and there's flyers that have gone out to our community and it's posted on our district calendar. It will be promoted in some other ways as well. We hope folks can join us with their questions. If they can't join us with their questions, there's a button on the website, submit them, and we will get those frequently asked questions answered online. Uh, there's also going to be a special event on March 29th. That's our Soup Zon event for folks who are business owners or residents of the district and they're older than 55. So that event is a regularly occurring event, pre-COVID, and is coming back for the first time and we will be here in this building at noon with our seniors who RSVP to my office that they'd like to attend. Uh, in that plan, we'll see that there are quite a few layers and what I'd like to do is just kind of go through what the tools are that we'll be using to make sure that we inform folks of FZ Prop 4 being on the April 5th ballot. Um, I'm going to kind of go from the widest net down to the narrowest kind of a scoop that you would use to clean out your swimming pool. Um, we have billboards that we regularly use around the district. So if you're entering the county on I-70, if you're entering the county on 364, or if you're traveling Highway K northbound or southbound, we have billboards and those will be used to promote FZ Prop 4's website for folks to get the best information. Um, brought in a bunch of yard signs today that will be di distributed to our buildings so that on their property you can let people know that there is an issue that they can learn more about and how to learn more about it. We've already had some press coverage through press releases and Dr. Gray will be appearing on KWRE's live wire on March 29th. So we work to make sure that we get as much out to the community at large as we can. There's district printed newsletters. We have been doing uh, advertorial with community news twice a year. And so that reaches their printed 25,000 uh, readers. And it also reaches those who visit their website and about 10,000 folks who get their email every week. So that will be coming out at the end of March. We have our local values newsletter that goes to 68,000 mailboxes across Fort Zoom Law School District. So that is another printed tool. And we have an e-blast through local values as well. The Fortitude podcast, Dr. Gregg has been talking about as he prop four in his superintendent's updates. And on February 27th, we will launch a special <coughs> frequently asked questions episode specifically about as he prop four. And once that launches on the Fortitude sites, we will add it to our overview of FZ Prop 4 on our regular website. Um, we're excited to be able to share this at the Board of Education meeting tonight so that folks who watch YouTube will be able to revisit the, the presentation if they can't make it to one of our meetings. Um, we've already met with parent leaders. And we've already shared this with principals and newsletters. Dr. Gray will be going to every faculty meeting over the course of the next weeks, he'll visit every school and speak with their faculty. 
We've already started sharing this with our staff in e-newsletters and in letters from Dr. DeBray. We've already started sharing this with our business partners at the O'Fallon Chamber of Commerce and Industries meetings and the Greater St. Charles Chamber of Commerce meetings. Again, there have been press releases and there will be plenty of social media as we come into the one month mark down to election day. We are on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as at FZ Schools. And we are on Instagram at official FZ Schools. So there will be plenty of uh, chances for our social media audience to learn more about us there. So at that point with the social media, is that something that's going to be available to, for, like, for us to click and share? Or and any post on Facebook, all you, can, all you have to do is hit share, and you can share it to your personal page. And then similarly, on Twitter, you can retweet. YouTube's the harder one to share, but you can grab the link and push that out on social channels if you like. The only thing I want to say is, uh, in addition is that the 125 million sounds like a lot. Uh, this is good time with interest rates. Um, and once we pass the 125, we can parcel that out, like I said, 50, 50, 25, or however you want to break it down. And we don't have to go back to the voters for another vote, which is expensive in itself to present that uh, out there on, on a, an election campaign. So um, we think it's a good time. We absolutely have to keep these buildings up in good shape for our students and our staff. Um, and I think we've crafted the, uh, uh, the projects in such a way, everybody gets something, every building is gonna be touched, and it's probably gonna take six to nine years to spend all the money, so. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a real face changer for the school district. And so just so we kind of understand the complexity of what we're trying to work on here, there's, I don't know, maybe the number's inflated, but there's somewhere close to 3 million square foot of building space here, is that correct? 2.7 million square feet of uh, floor space, which means 2.7 million Roof square space. feet of roofs up there, 650 acres. Um, for the school district. It's a, it's a big school district. And, you know, when you start looking at all this HVAC equipment that needs to be updated and everything, I mean, it, it starts adding up <coughs> millions and millions and millions of dollars. Lisa's done a good job uh, trying to keep up with it, but we, she hadn't had this kind of money to work with. So we're going we're gonna to put real money into some of these projects and really make a difference so that it's a game changer for us as we go forth. Any questions for Dr. DeBray or Laura Wagner regarding the prop board? None? Good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Final item, Dr. DeBray, I guess this kind of ties to the prop four. Yes, it does. Uh, in your agenda is a memo from Lisa Kester on the installation of the new football fields the turf at uh, north, south, and west. We've already installed it at east with bond issue, uh, money from the 2018 bond issue. Um, Lisa was able to get Vernon Jones, who was our installer, to give us the same price as uh, it cost to put east in almost a year and a half ago. So that's a good deal, and give us that same price for our other three fields. Um, they are willing to hold that price if, if we approve this this evening and uh, uh, hold that price and make it contingent on the passage of the bond issue. So if the bond issue wouldn't pass, uh, no harm, no foul on that. Uh, we are using the TIPS co-op, uh, which meets uh, all the requirements of the state of Missouri for bidding. And uh, this, this would be, as far as the district's concerned, would be a good deal if we're able to get the same price that uh, they gave us for East High School, same turf. Okay. So we'd recommend that you do that with the understanding it is contingent on the uh, bond issue passing. Any questions for Dr. DeBray or Lisa Kester regarding the new football fields that would be contingent on Prop 4? If there are none, I need a motion to approve the recommendation that has been uh, presented before you. Powers, second, Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you very much. Uh, comments from the board? We'll start with you, Mr. Moore. Uh, 
Um, kind of a more of a normal feel to uh, meetings tonight, so that was really good. Appreciate everybody uh, coming out and attending tonight. Thank you, sir. Mr. Holmes? Um, like uh, Craig has said, definitely feel like we're getting more to the normal meetings. You know, the meetings are coming more long than they have been. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Mr. George? Uh, thanks for all the uh, nice things. We've got a nice box of stuff to go through here for Board Appreciation Week. We really do appreciate you guys. Uh, like everybody else said, thanks for coming out. And uh, that's about it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kelly. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, make a comment about uh, Laura Wagner. She did a very effective job at the luncheon today uh, with the uh, O'Fallon Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, she went to great depth and breadth to explain the needs for, uh, for every one of the items involved in the issue number four. Excellent job. Thank you, sir. Mr. Evans. I'm going to add on to Mr. Callahan. The, so this, this bond is extremely important for this district. There are aspects of it that, um, that we simply need to continue supporting good foundation and infrastructure for our students and our staff. There's no way around it. Um, so we can come together and get these earlier to the future, and this is part of that future of building a, a school district that continues to be uh, something we can be proud of and strive to be proud of. Thank you, sir. I want to thank all the kiddos who read us cards and wrote us letters. We read them all, and we appreciate it, and all the teachers and the staff who did that as well. Um, I also bring this up every year and I continue to, that this week was um, Kindness Day. And we have a student that wanted everybody to share kindness that we lost too soon. And so in her memory, so we don't forget, Kara, um, I hope that everybody, especially right now, do something kind for somebody, whether it's hold a door open or smile, or give somebody a comment, it matters, and we need more of that. So please do. Please go out and do something kind. Thank you. And uh, thank you again to everyone who came tonight. The I would like to say just a special recognition to the four or five of you that read comments uh, from patrons regarding our teachers. Our teachers are in the front lines, in the battlefields every day with our students. And uh, I know the last two years, it's been tough on us, and I can only imagine what it's been like for our staff for our teachers. So thank you for bringing that to us. We do appreciate that. And I know they appreciate hearing their names and knowing that people can care for them too. So, and to everyone else who came out, thank you for your comments and your attendance. And uh, we do need to uh, spread the word regarding this uh, proposition again because of all the uh, facilities that we have here. We're doing what we do uh, for the public, for our students. Uh, the bond issue is not but in anybody's pockets, but to continue to maintain world-class facilities so that our children can learn and be in a great environment while doing so. So again, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I need a motion for this board to go into closed session under Missouri Statute 610.021. Uh, we'll approve the minutes from the January 18th meeting, the January 24th meeting, hiring, firing, promotion personnel, and legal matters. Moore, second. Okay. Holmes. Uh, roll call, please. Here. Gabriel. Yes. Craig. Yes. Tom. Yes. John. Yes. Tommy. Yes. Mike. Yes. All right, we're in recess. More hiding of good information. session anything else that pleases the board not need a motion to adjourn our, our second helms hang on my computer was still sleeping yeah. sorry i'll write it down now i gotta enter a 46 digit security code <laughs> I, i've written it down for you, you good? okay now i'm good okay we'll okay. call
roll call. Craig? Yes. Gabriel? Yes. Erica? Yes. Mike? Yes. Tommy? Yes. John? Yes. 